Hello, good afternoon. My name's Sarah. I'm one of the midwives here at the JR. I hope you're all doing well this afternoon. I thought we'd spend this afternoon talking about the early stages of labour and how you can best manage those at home. So what I thought we'd do is break it down into some little sections and I'll tell you when I've come to the end of the section, if you want to ask questions about what I'm talking about, and we'll answer each bit as we go along. So we often hear labour being talked about being three stages, but actually there's a, a prelim to all that. There's a stage before the first stage of labour, and that's what we call the latent stage of labour. And during the latent stage of labour, the cervix or the neck of the womb needs to thin and shorten. It hangs like a tube under your uterus or under your womb. And in the early stages of labour, it gets shorter and thinner until labour becomes established and the cervix starts to dilate and open. And with the first baby, that can take between 12, 24, maybe even 48 hours. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is, what are the signs that labour might be going to start, that latent phase is starting? And women often talk about having that sudden burst of energy, that nesting feel, feed it. sorry, I can't speak, feeling. So all of a sudden, you want to get everything out from under the stairs, clean out your kitchen cupboard, get everything ship shape ready for this new baby, which is fine. But do also consider that you might go into labour later that day or during that night. So don't be spring cleaning to the point of exhaustion. OK. Some ladies get a bit of um, backache or period type cramp. Um, and you might get that with those little practice contractions. You may already be experiencing some of those Braxton Hicks practice contractions that get the uterus limbered up and ready for you to labour and birth your baby. And so you might start off with that low backache, that little bit of, of crampy pain coming and going. You might experience a bit of diarrhea before you go into labour and that's the body's way of just getting everything out of the way ready for your baby to be born and um, your waters might break but that's only a very small number of ladies who that will happen for most of you your waters won't break until you actually come into the hospital but I know it's something you will worry about so what I'm going to say is they can go with a gush or a trickle and there's about a litre of water so it may be worth thinking about protecting your mattresses if you're getting up to the sort of 36, 37 weeks and they might go with a trickle and be less obvious to spot. So if your waters go with a gush they're going to be a strawy or a pinky colour uh, or they may go for with a trickle like that. When your waters break, we would ask you to ring the place you're going to have your baby, whether that be that you're going to have your baby here on the spires or on delivery suite or one of our lovely midwifery led units or to let the team know if you're having your baby at home. And they will arrange to see you and assess the baby. And as long as everything is well, they'll ask you to wait at home for a period of time because we know that despite COVID-19, ladies always establish in labour much better if they're at home where they can be relaxed and calm and in your own surroundings. So that's if your waters break, you're going to give the hospital a ring. So has anyone got any questions about the first, the signs that you may be going into labour? Nothing at the minute. Okay, so what can you do to cope with these early stages? Well, I often say to ladies, it's a, a bit like if you've got really bad period pain at the beginning of labour, 
So all those things that help with your period pain or your dull backache will probably help at the beginning of labour. So you might want to get yourself a, a nice warm hot water bottle to hold on your back or on your tummy or one of the wheat bags that you can heat up. Um, you might want to have a bit of gentle walking and keeping yourself in some nice upright positions as we've got here. You might want to think about taking some paracetamol, obviously following the instructions on your box, but that can be quite helpful in those early stages. You might want to ask your partner to give you a little back massage. And what I would say is try things out now, see what you like and what you don't like. Most ladies like the bottom of their back to be rubbed in the early stages of labour, but you may find it's your shoulders or the middle of your back. So have a practice with your partner and see what works and what doesn't. You might decide to go and have a warm bath for a little bit and that might help. If it happens in the middle of the night and you're able to take some paracetamol and go back to bed, we strongly recommend that. I promise you that if labour is going to establish, it will wake you up um, and, and you're not going to wake up with a baby in the bottom of the bed, okay? So you might want to think about going for a little walk, obviously practising your social distancing, but go out with your partner and just have a little walk. And that's going to help, again, help that baby's head to press down more firmly onto your cervix. We very often hear from ladies who say, well, I don't know what to do because um, I've been walking for an hour and my contractions were coming every three minutes and now I've stopped walking and they've gone off. Well, have a rest. We can't make labour happen. We can encourage it, but have a rest. Don't exhaust yourself. It will come back when it's ready. We've got lots of questions coming up now, so let's have a look. We've got Vicky here says, she's saying that her um, hind waters broke first. So that's the water trapped up behind the baby's head. And that when she came into hospital, the midwife broke the waters in front of her baby's head. So Vicky, you, you're saying you're a bit confused that there's, there's back and front waters. It's actually one big bag of waters. And then what happens is as that baby's head comes further and further down, it acts like a bath plug. And so it traps a little bit of the water in front of it and the rest of it stays up behind your baby's head. Um, Annie, you're asking, when do you need to go to hospital? You'd like to stay at home as long as possible. And I will cover that this afternoon. Uh, My friend said, this is Amy, who says you may get a mucus flow, which is bloody before your waters break. Is that correct? And yes, Amy, that's what we call the show. And that's that music mucus plug that sits in the uh, neck of the uterus um, and acts like a seal during pregnancy. So once that cervix starts to thin and open up, then that plug gets dislodged and starts to come away. And that can happen up to a week before you go into labour. More commonly, it happens sort of 24, 48 hours, but it can be as much as a week. So when it comes away, it is very mucus, mucusy and like stringy jelly and often very streaked with blood. And that's absolutely fine. And if that happens, you can just think, oh, my body knows what it's doing. We'll just hang on and see what happens. If you're getting fresh bleeding, so it's sort of, you know, more than just jelly, then you can always, always give us a ring, whether that be at the maternity assessment unit, um, the midwives at Wallingford, wherever you're having your baby, just if you're worried at any point, give us a ring and we'll see how we can help. Gosh, we've got lots, lots more coming in here. Can I get you to move back to so I've got Wendy's here helping me look. I'm, I'm not very good with the technical bits. Thank you. Uh, right, Tins. See ya. 
Where are you looking? Sarah, I'll use a tens machine. Yep, I'll talk to you about tens machines in a little while as well. And I think if you tune in tomorrow, um, my colleague Nikki is going to bring a tens machine down with her. So that will be good. I had far slowest two centimeters is five percent. What do you suggest in terms of how long I should wait to come in? We live our bins away, not around the corner. Many thanks. Right, I would say, um, Jade, I think what you need to do is have a chat with your own community midwife and make a plan as to what you're going to, to do this time. And she'll, she'll know exactly what your case is and where you're going to have your baby. And then she can help you make a plan together that's going to work for you. Uh, she can't hear anything. We're having a warm bath in early labour. Slow lay down. We're having a warm bath in early labour. Slow down labour progress, Steffi. No, if, if the uterus is just having a practice run, it may help to relax it. But if your body's getting ready and going to go into labour, then it, it won't stop things from happening. But like I say, if you wake up in the middle of the night and it's just irritating and you can't get to sleep, you might want to have a warm bath, take a couple of paracetamol and then get back into bed and see if you can doze off again because you might have a big day the next day. Uh, we've got lots of like tens. Uh, Lisa... How much time generally is it? So, like I said at the beginning, Lisa, it, it you know it varies with every woman, and that's what makes my job so exciting. But um, latent phase can last anything from about twelve to twenty-four hours on average, but can be as much as forty-eight hours with your first baby. Yeah. So, thank you, Green. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to talk. So we're talking about what you can do. One of the other things that um, I found helpful with my babies, and some people get cross with me saying this, is doing the ironing in that early stage. You won't do it again for 15 years, but just that gentle rocking motion as you're stood by the ironing board can help that baby just to jiggle down into your pelvis a little bit more. OK, and you can put a nice film on and stand and get everything done and know everything's ship shape and ready. So um, we talked about heat pads and things and you're forward leaning, using your birthing ball. Um, there's been a lot of questions about TENS machines, so I will just say a little bit. Sorry, I would have brought one in with me. So the TENS stands for transcutaneous, which means through the skin, electric nerve stimulation. And you may have seen a TENS machine. It's a little control box which has wires that attach to pads which you put on your back. And it works in three ways. What it does, it sends a little electrical, almost like a shock, but not as harsh as a shock, a little sen tingling sensation through the pads, which, one, give you something else to think about, to interfere with the messages going between those nerves in your brain saying this is getting a bit ouchy and three they actually using your tens helps to stimulate your own natural painkillers and um, so the earlier you use the tens machine the more helpful it's likely to be and you can if if you use it and everything stops Turn it off, put it away. You can always get it back out again. The pads can tend to lose their stickiness if you use them a few times. So what we say is get yourself any kind of lube jelly, lubricant jelly, um, and some micropore tape. And you can use the lubricant to make the contact on the pad and then just stick them back onto your back with a, a bit of um, micropore tape. I'm going to look and see what other questions we've got here at the moment. Uh, four pads on can be used with this maternity specific machine. That's just, I'm just going to answer Amy Marie's question about the TENS machine. 
Amy, what I would say to you about, there are loads of tens around for people to use for pulling knees and backs. What they don't tend to have on them is a boost button. So the obstetric tens has a button that you can press to increase the impulse while you're having a contraction. So it is, and you can hire them through boots, all sorts of places if you have a look online. And they usually send them out to you for when you're 37 weeks and you pay for three weeks higher. And then if your baby decides it's gonna come a bit later than that, most firms will give you those extra week, two weeks for free, okay? So in my previous labor last week before becoming active, and that was only in the hospital this happening again. So Emily Jane, you're asking whether you know your labour's like to be as long this time round. This obviously is your first baby. And usually with seconds and subsequent babies, the body's got a little bit more efficient in what it's doing. And whereas with your first baby, the cervix does that shortening up before it starts opening, with your second and subsequent babies, it will shorten and open all at the same time. So for the majority of women, labour is much shorter in second and subsequent births. Yeah. About Carla's, um, had her show, she's 36 weeks pregnant. I had some of my mucus plug come away two days ago. I'm 36 weeks pregnant. Um, Carla, I think if it's just a bit of mucus, I'd, I'd be okay for you just to wait and see what's happening. If um, it's bloody, perhaps have a word with your midwife because you're not quite 37 weeks and she might want to just check you over. And I'm just going to ask Wendy, would you agree with that, Wendy? So that's that one. Um, why don't you talk about contractions? Yeah. Regular and, yeah. And regular and so we've talked about these very early signs, and you probably all experience a bit, a bit, a few Braxton Hicks contractions, especially as your pregnancy progresses and your tummy is more stretched. And so, what happens is they start off, and you you feel your tummy go quite hard. And to start off with, the, your tummy will probably go hard for about 10 seconds and then relax. And then half an hour later, an hour later, you might feel it again. And slowly, as labour starts to begin, those tightenings will get closer together and start to last a little bit longer. OK, and so. They might start coming every 15 minutes, lasting for 10 seconds, and then every 10 minutes, lasting for 20 seconds. And you just it's just one of those things that's difficult to predict. You've just got to go with your body and find positions that you're going to be comfortable in. And it's all going to start from the top of your tummy and start pulling that cervix up and out of the way, ready for your baby to be born. Um, one of the things that ladies often forget in early labour is to eat and drink, okay? And, you know, that some people compare labour to a bit of a marathon. You need lots of energy. And so what we say is your body's going to tell you when it really doesn't want to eat anymore. And that's usually when labour labor's well established. But before then, it's important that you still putting some energy in. Um, you may want to stick to light things like thin soups and jellies or, you know, bits like that that are more easily digested. But in the main, your body will tell you when it's time for you to stop eating, okay? I'm gonna look and see what other questions we've got for a moment. We need a bit more on contractions going from being irregular to being regular. I was going to come to that in a bit, yeah. So Wendy's just saying about talking about your contractions. So once your contractions start to set in, settle into a regular pattern, you can start taking notice of when they happen. There are so, all sorts of apps available um, to help you 
monitor your contractions, but we do tend to find they're quite generous and, and they might lead you to believe you're a little bit further on in labour than you actually are. So just bear that bit in mind. So those contractions are going to start coming more regularly and building up. And you can do your walking and your massage and your all your lovely upright and forward leaning positions. And then they're going to start to get into a really nice regular pattern. And with your first baby, we would say once those contractions are coming every sort of three to five minutes and lasting for a good 40 to 60 seconds, and I've been doing that for an hour, then give us a ring. And obviously, if it's not in that pattern and you're worried, give us a ring. We're always happy to talk to you and we're all here waiting to look after you. So, if it's your second baby, then you may find that things happen a bit more quickly, as I said. So once those contractions are coming regularly between every sort of seven and 10 minutes, I would be thinking about making that phone call. Okay. And we will be waiting here to look after you if you're coming into the JR or your midwife will arrange to meet you at one of the birth centres. With your first baby, it's not unusual that you may came, come in and you've had lots of sort of tightenings that have helped your cervix to thin out but it's not started to really open yet and ladies can feel quite embarrassed about that please don't because it happens all the time and with your first baby you you don't know quite what to expect but we're always happy to speak to you and to see you and to see how things are going and advise you okay so we're going to have a look and see what other questions you're asking. So Natalie is saying that her first baby came very quickly and she's now 38 weeks with her second baby. And again, Natalie, I think, you know, you can have a chat with your community midwife and make plans, um, maybe consider having your baby at home this time. Or when you're feeling that you're getting those uh, regular contractions, you can give us a ring at the Spires. Um, I would say once they're coming every 10 minutes, if you give us a ring and explain what happened with your last baby and we can make a plan for you from there. If you feel you're not going to make it to the hospital, Natalie, then please do call 999 and they'll send um, an ambulance and some of our midwifery team to you. But that's if you really think, you know, you're, you're going to struggle to get to us. So Ella's asking if she's planning to give birth in Spires, but she lives in Banbury. Uh, could she, could she go to the Horton to be assessed? And yeah, that's that's a really sensible idea, Ella. And I'm with you there that you don't want to have to come all the way over to Oxford and then go home again. So yeah, that would be absolutely fine for you to give the Horton midwifery unit a ring. Can I need to be my birth people with? Leanne's asking a good question. Do I need to bring a birthing ball with me? I'm just looking around the room. See, Wendy's like a, my, my props lady. See, we've got lots of birthing balls here in the hospital. So actually, no, please don't bring your birthing balls with you because we've got nowhere to store them. So, Okay, so Leah, you're saying you're getting those practice contractions at the moment. Uh, I think it's your body is practicing for labor, Leah, and this is perfectly normal. Uh, I'm just seeing there's definitely going. 
Yeah. Yeah, you could take some, um, if it's feeling really irritable, you could take some paracetamol. It's not going to stop labour happening if it needs to happen, but it just might allow you to have a bit of relaxation and a little bit of, of rest. I would say, Lucy, um, if you've been having loose stools for sort of the last couple of weeks, that's probably not a sign of labour. Um, it, it might be worth um, having a word with your GP about that. Um, I mean, it could be that, that you've eaten something that's disagreed with you or you've got a bit of a bug going on. But it tends to be with your bowels for labour that, that your body has a sudden emptying just so that you've not got to worry about that actually during labour itself. Carla, you can use your pregnancy ball whenever you like. And if you're 36 weeks, I would say now would be a good time to use it and you can help it. You know, in the evenings, you might want to lean up against it. That's a good position to let your tummy hang and your baby settle into a really nice place. So I'm just looking. I'm sorry. I think it's Ayana. Sorry, my Greek's not very good. My Greek reading. I have two sweeps on my chin. Yes, um, your Ayana's asking if she comes in to be induced, is there a possibility that she might still be able to have her baby on the spires? And uh, I'm just, she can do that as long as, um, you know, she either has one gel or has her waters broken. If you need more, any more intervention, Ayana, then we, we might ask you to come to our delivery suite or move you to our delivery suite. But no, you're completely right. that if And it sounds like things are starting to get going, so you may well labour spontaneously and beat us to it. Um, so many stories. When is the birth partner going to come in and when do they go? So yeah, Sarah, this is something I know Wendy's covered a lot this week. So what we like you to do is come in on your own to be assessed. Now you're not gonna have to come wandering in anywhere completely on your own. Say you were coming to the spires, we'll get one of our support workers to come down and meet you and bring you up. And the midwife will um, take your details, see how you're doing, have a listening to baby and examine you. And then they'll make a decision whether you're gonna stay or whether you're gonna go. And we can from there decide whether to invite your partner in. As far as after your baby's born, um, while you're still in your delivery room, your partner will be able to stay with you. And it usually takes a little while after the birth for us to sort everything out. We as midwives have a lot of paperwork to do and um, we, we want to get you and baby sorted and dressed and washed and all those things. So there'll be a little bit of time before your partners um, need to leave you. Oh, that's very sweet. Is that so our last question at the moment? It is. So do you want to just read that Hannah said? Hannah has said here, I have had two babies, one at the JR and my last at home. And she's very happy for anyone ha who has questions to get in touch. And that's Hannah Louise Dalton. So you could hear it from the horse's mouth, so, so to speak, if you've got any other questions. I was just a few things. I know Nick is going to talk to you, I think, a little bit again tomorrow about coming into hospital or wherever you choose to, to give birth. 
And I've just jotted down a few useful things that sometimes don't appear on lists, okay? What I advise people is really good is to pack yourself either two or three small bags. Your first bag is your labour bag and that will leave the hospital with your birthing partner when they go, okay? But in your labour bag, you can have your bits like, I suggest an old t-shirt or an old shirt to wear in labour. If you're planning to use the pool, most ladies don't wear anything, but if you want to wear a, you know, a little crop top or something like that, you can do. Um, the other one I always say to people about is bringing in some lip salve because if you decide to use the gas and air, the Entenox, it can be really, really drying on your lips. And it's just nice to be able to moisturise your lips. With this warmer weather, the um, something like a, a sponge that your partner can dip in cold water and put on your forehead for you will be nice. Partners need to remember that it is warm in the hospital and our delivery rooms, especially our pool rooms, do tend to get really warm. So you might want to bring shorts, t-shirts and flip-flops in to wear while your partner's in labour, so you're nice and comfortable. And the other thing is that partners, we don't feed you. We, we look after your partner, but we don't feed you. So in those early stages of labour, one of the things you can both be doing is preparing your partner's snack box. And he can bring that in because we do want you to keep eating. We, we don't want you to feel all faint and funny when that baby comes in. You should be happy and holding your baby. So a nice big butty box there. And I just want to say good luck to you all. We're all here. I know it's a really scary time, but we're all here waiting to look after you and to make sure you have a really positive birth experience. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you, Sarah, for today. Um, so uh, if there are any more questions, I think some might have just popped ah. in. Um, so I can take over and give Sarah yeah. a break. She can have a, a drink of water. Thank you. Um, so Holly, you've asked, are partners allowed in for booked cesarean sections? Um, yes, Holly, they are. Um, again, they will attend with you for the cesarean, stay for the cesarean. And when you transfer to the postnatal ward, they will go with you. They will go home, sorry, not with you. Um, Lisa, you wanted to have your baby at Wantage, but it's now closed for... It's obviously just closed for births. They're still doing antenatal and postnatal care there. Um, and you said, if you want to have it in the spires, do you need to just let the JR know? Yes, Lisa, you can choose where to have your baby um, on the day that you're having your baby. We are saying to people um, who are planning to birth in Wantage, if you want to um, go to Wallingford, that may be closer for you, um, for you to um, then make traveling all the way to the John Radcliffe. But if you want to come to the spires, as long as you um, meet the criteria and that you don't have a high risk pregnancy, um, then, then please do come to the spires, but give them a phone beforehand. Elvira, um, you're asking about natural birth without epidural um, and uh, can help to avoid episiotomy. Um, you're saying if, if you did need to have an episiotomy, which is the cut that we sometimes have to do to help the baby be born a bit quicker than baby wants to be born, um, or if we were doing an instrumental birth, um, that's another reason we do an episiotomy to stop you from having a bigger, um, some more damage down below. Um, they're the two main reasons for doing it. Um, we wouldn't do an instrumental birth on the spires. So if, if we felt that you needed some help from the doctors having your baby, we'd transfer you to delivery suite. But if you just, um, either you or the baby was tired and you were on the spires and you needed to have an episiotomy, yes, we can do it on the spires. So Gayla here, um, you're saying, is there anything else but bouncing the ball and walking I can do to trigger real contractions? Um, and you're a week overdue and obviously desperate to have your baby. Um, it would be nice, I'm sure. Um, Gayla, there are many positions that you can try. Um, there is a poster, I don't know if you can see, 
over here you might be able to zoom in on later that shows alternative positions that you can try. Um, I'm a big fan of dancing, you know, put some music on and dance yeah. around. Sarah can do her ironing, I'll give her mine to do <laughs> too, but um, I'm much more into dancing Sorry. because that is about opening up your hips. Yeah. But you have to balance any walks and exercise you're doing versus resting, because as Sarah said, you don't want to end up going into labour exhausted. So there should be a balance. But babies are just stubborn um, and they will come when they want to come. But, um, you know, by keeping your balancing yourself between being mobile and resting will make a big difference. Nikki, you're planning a home water birth with hypnobirthing. If the baby has not arrived by 41 weeks, do you need to have an induction? Nikki, we have um, certain criteria for when we induce people. Um, for most people, um, low risk um, pregnancies, if you are under the age of 40 at the time that you booked, we're happy for your pregnancy to go to 42 weeks before we induce you, which gives you the best chance of going into labour. However, if you're, if you're older than that, um, we, we might induce at 41 weeks. Um, and, and for some of our older mothers, we might induce even earlier than that. Um, but your midwife will advise you on when the right time is. And also, you know, induction of labour is a choice. You know, we make a decision about whether you want to be induced or whether you want a little bit more time um, to wait for natural labour. But please discuss that with your midwife. Sorry, Christina. Christina, when you had your daughter two years ago, you had pain and pressure in your lower back. And you heard that that's something called a back labour. Is this a thing? Can you explain why it is and why it happens? Um, and is it common, uncommon, more painful? So, Christina, people used to think that a back labour was associated with a baby lying back to back with you. But actually, there's lots of evidence out there that shows it's more likely that your baby is in a, what we call a deflexed position. So what a baby should do, she says, remove my jumper to try and demonstrate. If I had a, a doll and pelvis, I'd show you. What a baby should do is tuck its chin right down so that the smallest diameter of the head is coming forwards. But what happens sometimes when baby is negotiating the pelvis is instead of tucking their chin down, their chin is up which means it's a slightly wider diameter in the pelvis. And what happens is that wider diameter sits in your pelvis and all the nerve endings there get very excited and, and you get, it, it's a bit more um, intense in terms of the pain and you tend to experience it in your back. What we need to try and do is encourage that baby to descend into the pelvis further and tuck its chin out. And that's when as a midwife, we'd encourage you to go on your hands and knees. You can do that at home. Um, be on your knees and leaning up on, on, the be on your bed or on the sofa, um, climbing your stairs, um, if you have stairs. Um, we're very cruel and mean and make you climb them two at a time, but that just opens up your pelvis a bit more and encourages baby to descend. But it's just something that can happen. Um, and as the contractions heat up and get stronger, hopefully that will make baby descend further into your pelvis and tuck their chin down. Um, so because you've had it the first time round, doesn't mean that you'll have it the second time round. Second labours and births are so completely different. They're generally less than half the time. Um, and what happens is because your pelvis has a bit more stretch in it this time, baby is more likely to descend and flex itself um, and come out much quicker. So I hope that helps answer that question. Sarah, I'm glad that you're finding the information helpful for you and hope that it is for other people. Um, Verity, are birthing partners always going to be allowed to be with you during labour and birth? Or may this be stopped if the virus gets worse? Verity, I am desperately hoping that we will not uh, stop birth partners from being present. It is more crucial than ever that we are telling people to stay at home. I was really sad this morning driving to work to see that the numbers of cars and vans on the road has increased dramatically today. So people aren't still staying at home. They're not self-distancing. Um, there was a crowd of sort of 20 year olds on a park bench in our village when I came home the other night. Five, four or five of them packed onto a bench. There wasn't even 
10 centimetres between them, never mind two metres. So if we get to that point, it will be because people are not um, self-distancing and we've had to get much stronger measures. So all I can do is encourage you to get the message out there that people are putting us at risk. Um, so they really do need to stay at home. Um, Jennifer, you're saying, thank you for doing this. When you said that birth partners can stay a little while after the baby's born when you're doing paperwork, are we talking minutes or a couple of hours or so? Um, Jennifer, I, you know, if efficiently wise, we should be finished our paperwork and, um, you know, have got you sorted and ready to go to the postnatal ward or home within an hour or two. I have to say that we're not as efficient at that and sometimes it takes a lot longer than that to do it. So um, you're talking at least an hour um, or more. Um, before we can um, get you get you onto the postnatal ward. Vicky, you've asked what size of baby clothes should you put in your bag? Um, Vicky, I would say to you to just buy um, a couple of newborn outfits. Um, leave the labels on, just in case you have an unsurprisingly bigger baby. Um, but I wouldn't buy more than just a couple of outfits to begin with. Um, you will also be overwhelmed by the amount of things that people will give you afterwards and they tend to give you things for newborn babies. So just I will pack a couple of newborn baby grows and a couple of newborn vests um, and, and a normal term baby size nappy. Um, and uh, just don't buy too much of anything um, in case you end up with a baby that's a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger. Verity, are home births going to be stopped if community staffing um, and calls in the ambulance service get worse? Verity, it is a possibility. I'm not going to lie to you. It's something that we will, um, we will struggle to do. We want to be able to still offer you as much choice as possible. We obviously have to keep you safe um, and we are in touch with the ambulance service on a regular basis to ensure that if you were at home birth and you needed to transfer, we could provide that service safely and not put you at risk. So at present, they're still running, but obviously it comes back to, can we contain this virus? Um, and can we keep our staff at work? And again, with that, can I please plead people, if you are in a house with somebody who has a cough and you think they have symptoms, you have to, that it has to be the first thing you tell your midwife when you talk to them on the phone, because we have to screen you appropriately to reduce the risk um, to our staff um, and other people that we work with. Um, so please, please let us know. It should be one of the first things you tell us. Lee, uh, is Chipping Norton still fully running at the moment? Uh, and if you need episiotomy or stitches, can this normally be dealt with there or would you need to transfer? Lee, Chipping Norton, the Horton, Wallingford are all still fully functioning as freestanding midwifery led units and um, open to birth. And the same applies for any of our birth environments or at home. If you need to have an episiotomy, yes, a midwife has the equipment and can do it. Um, and yes, she can stitch you. Very occasionally, the stitches that you need are such that actually giving you um, better pain relief, having better lighting, would mean that we could um, repair it more readily. Um, and because what we want to do is have the best effect for you afterwards. So in those circumstances, we may transfer you for stitching, but the majority of cases we can deal with it at home. Um, Prem, yeah. Your baby is head down facing forward. Should I be concerned since I was planning a home birth? I'm 40 weeks on Friday. Um, Prem, you raise a point that um, I love addressing, so thank you um, for this. People really, really worry about the position their baby is in at the beginning of labour. And they're always asking the midwife, is my baby back to back? What's happening? It is absolutely irrelevant at the beginning of your pregnancy. The, the key thing is, is your baby head down or not? But in actual fact, the position of baby as it enters your pelvis, your pelvis is such that a baby will naturally fit in your pelvis side on or round on your back because there can be a curve at the back of your pelvis 
that means that baby descends into your pelvis more round on the back. So there is nothing that you can do to prevent how that baby's going to enter the pelvis. And that doesn't mean at the beginning beforehand, if your baby's back to back, that you're going to experience any problems. The normal mechanism of labor is that with good uterine contractions, your baby head descends down, it flexes and it makes a nice rotation inside the pelvis. Now, what it should do is rotate forwards so that it can slip under your symphysis pubis, which is the joint at the front of your pelvis, um, for the baby's head to be born. Now, some babies can be a little bit more tricky. And when they go into the pelvis, instead of doing that short rotation forwards, they decide to go the long way round. And as they go round the long way, what they do instead of keeping their head tucked down is they extend their chin. And thus, instead of it being this smaller nine and a half centimetre diameter coming forwards, it can be much wider. Um, and, and that's why babies can just take a little bit longer to make that turn um, around in your pelvis. So the position that your baby is in at the start of labour is completely irrelevant. We won't know how that baby, what position that baby's going to be in until it manoeuvres its way through the pelvis. And what I'll do is my colleague Nikki is coming to talk tomorrow uh, about the stages of active labour and I will ask her to bring a dolly and a pelvis with her so that she can visually show you what Wendy's talking about. Yes, rather than me waving my hands about, which I normally do. Ah, Verity, uh, you would like to have a private discussion with myself or Emily about your previous birth experience. Um, Verity, what I'd ask you to do is if you contact your community midwife, um, they can send us all your details and we can arrange, I'm afraid at present, their telephone consultations uh, rather than face-to-face -face consultations, but Emily and I um, are doing uh, these conversations every week. I'm glad I'm making you smile. It's my, it's my madness, I think. Uh, Sarah Jane, um, you're 33 weeks pregnant and you've been getting some pain in your coccyx when you're on all fours. Um, you're keeping active and haven't had this pain in pregnancy. Um, do I know of any reason why this would be? You're concerned about being in labour with it. Again, Sarah, Jane, if we talk tomorrow when we have the pelvis, we can show people where the coccyx is. It's a little tiny bone on the bottom at the back of the pelvis. And sometimes as everything's stretching, um, uh, it can, um, and, and the position that the baby's in may cause some discomfort. I think if you're struggling being on all fours with your coccyx, um, it, it may just be because of, of the stage of pregnancy you're at, how your baby's lying, but perhaps try a different position, you know, go on to your left side. Uh, being on your left side, having a baby is really good as well. We're opening up the pelvis, so it's another option for you. See how you feel sitting down um, um, on it as well. I'm not sure you've said it's sore on all fours. Is it sore when you're sitting down, being on your birthing ball? We have birthing stools um, here as well, um, which enable, they're a bit like a toilet seat, but without the water underneath. Um, and you can sit on those which will help. We just need to try a different position um, to uh, free that up so it's not painful for you. Um, Ella, you've raised it. How many weeks is my baby unlikely to turn? Um, are you talking about your baby being head down or bottom down? Um, Bottom down babies are, um, almost two thirds of babies are bottom down um, during the second and into the third trimester. But generally by 36, 37 weeks, um, if a baby's going to turn to be head down, it will then. And if baby hasn't turned, we have a, a really good breach service here run by one of our midwives, a few of our midwives actually, um, and they will be able to uh, have a look at it and see whether they can help baby to turn. Um, but only three to four percent of babies are actually bottom down um, by 37 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, Verity, um, you're asking if pregnant women can get the whooping cough vaccine privately. Um, as you've been told by midwives, the trust has stopped doing these due to coronavirus. Um, Verity, I'm not sure. 
So what I'm going to do is find an answer to that question and post it like I've done before, um, because um, I don't want to give you false information. Uh, Natalia, you like uh, hypnobirthing um, and use of essential oils. You've asked if you can bring a diffuser and oils with me. Natalia, if you have your own preparation that you would like to bring with you in terms of oil, you can. We do have um, diffusers and essential oils available um, in the unit, um, and I've got most of those are up to date, I think. I don't think there's anything missing just now. But if you want the, if you found a particular smell or particular blend that works for you, um, then please do bring it with you. But generally, you don't have to bring your diffuser with you. But if you want the comfort of having your own diffuser equally, that's fine. Verity, you want to know if the new, um, we have a new caseloading team of midwives, um, if they're likely to be disbanded and redeployed due to the virus pressures. Um, Verity, they are not. They are still up and fully running and they are still receiving referrals. Um, they have been on times when they haven't been as busy. They have offered us help, which is amazing, um, but they are still available um, to see their women. They can't always go out to women's homes as they were planning to do. Pardon me, as part of the pressures, um, but they're still staying in touch and these women are still getting the care that is required. Natalia, you're waiting for consultation with me apparently. Um, regarding your birth plan, because with your first baby you lost a little bit more blood and then had a bigger tear. Um, you want to have a second birth at home using hypnobirthing um, and, um, and you want to discuss this in more detail. Um, Natalia, I'm sorry you haven't had that appointment with me. It will either be with myself or um, Emily Brace, the other consultant midwife. Um, if you could get in touch with your midwife, she can chase that referral to make sure that we can see you um, and get that consultation set up. Um, Verity, you said that you've already asked your community midwife um, about seeing me. Um, Verity, if you would like to message Maternity Voices Partnership and tell me who your midwife is, um, and provide your uh, unique hospital number, the MRN number, um, then I can chase that up if you haven't had any luck with your midwife. Chloe, you're asking how many birthing pools we've got and how do you secure a room with a pool? Chloe, if you're planning to birth on the spires, we have three rooms with pools. If you're planning to birth on delivery suite, we have one room with a pool. Uh, Wallingford, I gather, has two. two. Uh, Wallingford has two pools, Cotswold Maternity Unit has two pools, two. and the Horton has one pool. Um, so we can't guarantee anyone having a pool birth, but generally we manage to provide them. What we tend to do is um, when somebody arrives who wants a pool, if somebody's just given birth um, in a pool, we may encourage them quickly into another room. Um, so that we can clean the room and the pool to make it available for you. So there might be a delay, but generally we can offer you a pool. Um, and hopefully you understand that if you'd just given birth and you were breastfeeding your baby and we rushed you into another room to, to enable us to clean the pool for the next person, uh, you'd understand that that's fair. You just have a look. Really liked have a look. this, didn't you? <laughs> So let's have a look. We're on to Gemma. To Gemma. She, she says, uh, Gemma says, I'm 34 weeks pregnant. And I have an, again, about the whooping cough vaccine. Is it too late now? I don't yeah. know. Hoop, whooping cough is, is I, I know you're probably very disappointed in me that I don't know everything, but I, I don't, don't know, know what's everything. happening with it. Um, but what I will do is I will contact somebody who does and I will post um, what's happening about ho hooping cough for you uh, so that you'll see. Oh, I think I've done that. So we've got Hannah who's saying thanks so much. I'm weathering whether my partner will reach the time to come into hospital. Can we both bring our own pillows? Uh, if we are in for the long haul? You can bring your own pillows. My advice has always been to put them in the most disgusting pillowcase that you can 
so that they stand out and they don't end up in the hospital cleaning. But you are more than welcome to bring your own pillows in with you. That's fine. And Carla is saying, my baby is measuring a bit smaller. And I had my 36 week appointment cancelled. So the midwife's referred you for another scan, but you haven't heard anything in over two weeks. What should I do? I think, Carla, what I would do is please contact your community midwife and ask her if she could chase that for you. Hey, so we've got Jess. That's about your bags. Oh, that's about my bags because I didn't finish, I don't think. So I said a small bag for your labour things and then either one slightly bigger bag with yours and baby stuff for afterwards or two smaller bags. And you, you can bring in, what we don't like you to bring in is a massive suitcase because getting, if we need to get around your bed and help you after you've had your baby, there's not a lot of space in hospital and, and they can be a bit cumbersome and get in the way. So some smaller hold all type bags are ideal. Uh, I'm, what's Nicola saying? I'm so it's, she's, it's about induction again. Nicola, if you do have to be induced, as Sarah was saying earlier, as long as we don't have to give you the oxytocin drip, the bit that helps, the hormone drip that helps you to contract um, and everything is otherwise well with you and the baby, uh, then you can come up to the spires to have your baby. So let's have a look at... Can you describe a contraction? Can you describe a contraction, please? Ooh. <laughs> so, so the, the whole of your uterus is a muscle. And whereas most muscles, like your muscles in your arms, they tense up and then they relax. And they tense up and all the muscle fibers shorten and they relax. When it comes to you having a baby, the muscle of your uterus works slightly differently in that when you have a contraction, the muscle tenses and it's tensing up this way so it's pulling that cervix, thinning it up and pulling it up out of the way. And then when it relaxes, it doesn't fully. So we've gone tense, relax with our normal muscles, with our uterine muscles. We're going to go tense, relax, but not quite all the way. And that's so that that muscle gets shorter and shorter as your labour goes on to open that cervix up. So... In the early stages, I would say it feels a bit like period pain. Um, and you get that, your tummy feels hard, like with a, a Braxton Hicks contraction. As labor starts to establish and those contractions are going to get a bit longer, sort of 40 seconds to a minute, they're going to slowly build. So the strength of that contraction slowly builds up and builds up and gets stronger until about halfway through the contraction, and then it slowly starts to ebb away, okay? It's, um, it's a feeling like no other, um, but if you're having your Braxton Hicks contractions, that's probably the closest thing to your labour contractions. Would you add anything to that, Wendy? Yeah, I think it's just about getting used to that feeling of it being tight. Tight, yeah. Um, it's incredibly tight and it kind of takes your breath away. So it, more before the pain even starts, it's the tightness that you just feel like everything's been really, really stretched and, and might go pop. Of course, it's not going to go pop. It's then going to relax again. But those contractions, they kind of build into a peak. So it's a, a bit like uh, cycling up a hill. You know, you're going up the up the hill and it's not so steep to begin with. And then it gets very steep and intense at the top. And then it starts to go off again um, and goes back down for the uterus to relax. So the pain is just not wham, bam there and stays that intense the whole way. What happens is you start to feel it build. So you start to feel everything start to tighten and there'll be some pain. And then it will get to the point that you think, wow, this is starting to take effect and have an impact as you hit the top of that hill. 
um, and then it will start to go off again. So that's why, you know, it's really good to try and use visualization, whether it's hypnobirthing, mindfulness. I have worked with a couple who use cycling and allergies throughout um, labor, but it's about trying to see that concept of that contraction, go up to a peak and then come down again. And the intense bit, the bit that's really painful is quite short in the top actually compared to the length of the contraction. So contraction may last for 60 seconds, but the actual real intense bit may actually be 20 seconds. Now, if you were to hold your breath for 20 seconds, actually, it is quite a bit of time. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not like, oh, that bit was easy, but you, you have to appreciate that it will build to the crescendo um, and then it will ease off again. Um, and those, like Sarah was saying earlier, those will come to begin with quite irregular. Some of them are shorter than others. Some last longer than others. Some are felt to be more painful than others. And that whole irregular pattern is in it to enable you to build up some resilience to them um, and use your coping mechanisms to help. But when you start to go from that latent phase of labor, which we've been talking about today into the active phase that we'll talk about tomorrow, you know, you know the difference because almost you can set your watch by them. You know, they're happening just as frequently. They're lasting just as long and each one was as painful as the last. And that helps you to know what's coming next. Okay, so um, there was somebody just saying that they've missed what Wendy had said about securing a birthing pool. I think, am I right, Wendy, that people can play this? This will be posted and they can play it again later. Yeah. So if you play it again later, you'll have all the details about our birthing pools. So I've got someone, Lauren, here saying... Uh, There's actually quite a few. So we've got Lauren, Verity and Lisa talking about our 36-week scans. Can I reassure you that we're looking at all the care packages that we're offering and changes we've made due to COVID all the time to see what we'll be doing. Um, and at present, we're in discussions about whether we can keep the 36-week scan or not. Now, I can't guarantee we will be, um, but we're looking at it to see whether we can keep that going. So we will we uh, do a lot with the Maternity Voices Partnership, and it's our, uh, a great way for us to reach out to you guys to tell you what's happening. So please watch this space. And as soon as I know what's happening with the 36-week appointment, I'll get that out to you. I think that's us. Yeah. Uh, one, this will be the very last one. So Leah says, uh, our partner is currently allowed in the hospital birth center when you first arrive in labor, or do they need to wait until you've been assessed first? Yes, uh, Leah, we ask you to come in on your own for your partner to wait in the car or however it got there outside um, while we make our assessments. And obviously, if we find you're in established labour and you're staying, then they can come in and, and be with you. And if you're going home, then they can help take you home. So we've kind of given you a whistle stop tour today and hopefully answered some of your questions. Um, so it's just about, you know, Sarah was talking about how we can do some things to help you stay at home and um, hopefully let you know what the contractions are like. Um, and, um, and then uh, we're fortunate to have Nikki, who's one of our community midwives, coming tomorrow. Um, and she's going to talk to you about what happens when you're in established labour. Um, and we're going to keep finding new things to talk to you about um, and, and hopefully answer your questions um, along the way. So um, we're going to leave you for today um, and hopefully you can get out and enjoy your nice walk in the sunshine. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, Wendy, I 